Circuit Court of Appeals in New York City heard argument today in Fox Television versus the FCC. The court will decide if the FCC's indecency policy on the broadcast of curse words during live programs violates the First Amendment. Participates in the nearly 90-minute argument use words some may find offensive. Viewer discretion is advised. We have one case on our calendar on remand from the Supreme Court. Um, we'll hear first from appellant, respondent, petitioner. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Carter Phillips, and I represent Fox Television as the petitioner in this case. Uh, the last time we were here, at the end of the argument, the court, in its opinion, expressed skepticism uh, that the uh, Federal Communications Commission would be able to defend its fleeting expletive regime on, on, under constitutional attack. Uh, for better or for worse, we are now here to determine whether or not that skepticism may have uh, matured into a firm conviction that the Constitution uh, is violated by the FCC's decency regime. But it's clear the Supreme Court didn't reach the issue of the constitutionality. Uh, the, um, the opinion for the court, Judge Pooler, could not be clearer that the court took no position with respect to that issue. There are a number of, uh, there are two concurring opinions that expressly uh, declined to, you know, we're very clear that the court's saying nothing about it and the two concurrences. Counsel, you it was argued barely. before the Supreme Court on state of mind on Center, didn't you? We did have uh, and they, that and argument. And the opinion, as I read it, from the Supreme Court doesn't mention that at all. No, do you, it doesn't. Do Again. you have any idea why this attracted so little interest? Well, I think the court uh, basically took the case up on the FCC's petition. The FCC was very explicit in, its, in, in the petition and in the way it presented the case on the merits, that it wanted the issue strictly evaluated on the uh, Administrative Procedure Act grounds, and therefore discouraged the court from considering un either of the alternative issues. Uh, since you raised the Scienter issue, I, it, you know, in fairness to the court, obviously that is a non-constitutional alternative ground on which to set aside the FCC's order in this case. The order specifically states uh, that Fox Television uh, in these particular broadcasts violated Section 1464, and both as a matter of statutory interpretation, that statute would require intent, uh, even though it's not stated. The Supreme Court's got a line of cases that say if the criminal statute is silent, you will infer a requirement of scienter. And then, but over and above that requirement that's embedded in the statutory scheme to begin with, obviously this is a First Amendment protected activity, and as such, there's no way you could enforce. The FCC says we don't need to reach that because they did not order any forfeiture. They say that, and, and I understand that argument. The problem right. is, of course, their opinion specifically says Violation. that we violated Section 1464. They say that's a quibble. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I think when a federal agency declares you in violation of the federal criminal statute, that's not a quibble to suggest that that has to be set aside. And then if you're in, in the world of Chenery, where the, this court has to evaluate the grounds given by the commission for its actions, if you take that, side, that out of the equation, whether the commission would reach the same result, this court can't assume that it would. It would ordinarily remand to allow it to evaluate the intent requirement. That said, I, I know my colleague, Mr. Estrada, and I both, and our clients, would far prefer that the court not simply address that narrow ground and vacate for this specific outcome, that indeed there are broader principles at stake here. And we think it's important that the court decide the constitutional. Finally, once and for all. Well, as Justice Ginsburg said, the long shadow of the First Amendment has been cast over this decision. And it seems to me at some point, hopefully, the courts will be in a position to actually evaluate that First Amendment issue, and this so case, do, I think, is a good vehicle. Do you for agree doing that. that if we turn to the constitutional issue, and Pacifica is still a case that binds us, um, that we would apply intermediate scrutiny? 
I, yeah, I, I mean, I'm comfortable with intermediate scrutiny. I don't think the court has to decide that. I do think, I think it's difficult to think about something that is as content specific and non-neutral as the regulations that the Commission has in place here as subject to mere intermediate scrutiny as opposed to strict scrutiny. But I don't think it makes any difference okay. in this particular case. Okay. If it's case. intermediate scrutiny, then, uh, tell me where the uh, remand order, the Golden Globes, um, uh, or the omnibus order, tell me where it fails. No compelling government interest or not narrowly tailored? I don't think it. I don't think it satisfies either of those standards. I okay. don't think there's any evidence to demonstrate that there is a significant injury to minors by exposure to a single word. The Supreme Court said it was common sense that these words are bad for kids. They, they may be bad for kids. The question is, is there a compelling state interest? I'm not sure it rises to that level. I'm not saying that, that the, the government doesn't have a legitimate state interest, and it's important to evaluate what the court was saying in that context. It's, it's only considering the Administrative Procedure Act theory of the case. And there you're talking about the, the, the most deferential scrutiny to what the commission does. So to say that it satisfies whatever the, the government would have to do in order to justify non-arbitrary and capricious decision making seems to me is a, is a leap from that to conclude that this is a compelling state interest. So I, have, I, 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 think, I don't think it satisfies that. And then on na narrow tailoring, it seems to me it's clearly not narrowly tailored because there are the V-chip, there is a whole technology out there. But, but I think it's probably even a mistake for the court to kind of go through the intermediate standards. I think the more appropriate way to analyze this case is to simply look at Pacifica and, and recognize that what the Supreme <coughs> Court said there represents the outer limits of what the First Amendment permits. Now, a prior decision of our court um, stated, indeed ruled, that the Supreme Court in Pacifica had implicitly uh, passed with approval um, on the vagueness of the, of, the re of the regulatory scheme. What do you say about that? The dial information Right. dial information services case. Right. The, and the D.C. Circuit has, has taken that, that right. view as well. And but the I, mean, I think Circuit the answer is that that's not correct, although I recognize this panel doesn't have an opportunity to revisit that issue. That's part of the reason why I think it is more sensible or easier for this court simply to examine what are the outer limits of what Pacifica allows as a matter of First Amendment law. And, and if the regime that the FCC has put in place decidedly goes beyond what well, the, the, Pacifica um, permits, and it's unconstitutional. The dial information case was in 1991, and of course the Pacifica case was way back in what year was 1977, that? 1977. Um, um, I wonder whether uh, even if the Pacifica case did pass on the um, vagueness as it existed at that time, um, is it arguable that the vagueness is quite different now as a result of the interpretive, the various rulings the the commission has made uh, in the past uh, decade? Well, I mean, I think there are two answers to that. Yes, I, th I think you could say that beyond vagueness, there is the separate First Amendment principle of granting to the government un unbridled discretion how to apply. I mean, at the time of Pacifica, what the court ruled was that the that the commission um, uh, uh, is authorized to find indecent the uh, Carlin filthy words, dirty words broadcast. Exactly. Right. There's a big difference between that and uh, and a passing remark that somebody is a bullshitter, um, uh, or the 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 the, the, the share fuck them. Uh, those are very very different things, and the. The commission's uh, arguably, uh, arguably contradictory and bewildering rulings as between words that are and words that are not seem to me to create a um, um, uh, a, a kind of bewildering, uh, a bewildering vagueness, which arguably results in a chill vastly beyond anything the Supreme Court ruled on in Pacifica. Well, that's uh, that's absolutely clear. Judge Laval, because if you, if you read Justice Powell's concurring opinion in Pacifica, the reason why he embraced what the majority was prepared to do in that case 
was because he said the Commission has been very explicit that it will narrowly confine its enforcement efforts, that it will be extremely reluctant to find any, fo any form of indecency or to enforce that. And, under that, and with that understanding, uh, blessed that particular application, which is why I think when you look at this case, rather than kind of going through the, the strictures of strict versus intermediate scrutiny, the more appropriate way to look at it is to say, clearly the First Amendment precludes the kind of chill that this kind of a regime will create. And then the question is, is there anything in, in constitutional law that would justify it? And the, and the only thing they have to turn to is Pacifica, and there the Supreme Court was absolutely clear that we are not inviting the Commission to engage in a roving opportunity to seek out any kind of specific words that they find offensive. I mean, today the words are shit and fuck. Who knows what they'll be tomorrow uh, as the Commission decides on a, on a person by person basis. I mean, it's interesting. We, we sort of thought we knew what the Commission's rules might be, although I don't know that I could go anywhere beyond the, the bewilderment position that you've taken. But of course, the commission changes. And so now we have no idea what the new commission's perspective well, may Justice be. Justice Ginsburg thought that um, Pacifica was tightly cabined. That's her phrase. But the FCC believes Pacifica was just the beginning of um, a, a regulatory scheme. That's, that's what it comes down to how we view Pacifica. I, I think that's exactly right, Judge Pooler. That is precisely the issue for you to resolve. And I, I think if you look at the opinion on its face, particularly in light of the concurring opinion by Justice Powell joined by Justice Blackmun, which are the pivotal uh, two votes They for made it. the majority. And, and, and therefore, you know, what is the narrowest ground on which the Constitution has been espoused? That, that would be that in a, any world where you have a very narrow enforcement <laughs> rule applied to repeated statements, intentional, deliberate, everything that goes with that, that's something that perhaps the Commission continues to have the authority to pursue. Might fight that in the Supreme Court someday if I had a chance. But that's a long way from where this court has to go in terms of saying, look, that's where we think the, the Supreme Court drew the line. And the other thing, the other part of this case is nothing that's happened in the 30 years since Pacifica was, this 30 plus years since Pacifica was decided should move any court to say, well, we ought to be expanding the FCC's regulatory authority, because again, actually, uh, the majority opinion said that because broadcast is the only regulatory exactly. area, we should be expanding it. That's the safe haven for kids. Right, but again, you have to recognize that what the court, what the court's analyzing in that context is the Administrative Procedures Act, and and when you're talking about APA review, which is extremely deferential. Sure, discussing it in terms of a safe haven might be a rational way to proceed. But when you, when you impose any kind of First Amendment scrutiny to that, the notion of creating a safe haven for children and thereby expo requiring everybody who's not a child to be limited to whatever is acceptable to children is a position, frankly, the First Amendment simply doesn't well, accept. Pacifica, Pacifica, the first sentence and the last sentence of the opinion uh, stated the question to be uh, nothing other than uh, whether a broadcast can be found to be indecent if it's not obscene. Right, that was, the, that, that was actually what was argued in that particular case. The rest of the discussion about the First Amendment meets and bounds is frankly dicta, which is another reason why I think the court ought to simply construe Pacifica as, near, as narrowly as candidly I believe the court intended it to be construed. And under those circumstances, what the FCC done here, has done here should be set aside. Uh, one of the things that um, the FCC and the majority opinion below feared is that if fleeting expletives are allowed, we will be inundated with fleeting expletives all the time, one at a time. Has that happened in the years since Pacifica? No, and, and it's important to put that in context because obviously it has been available to the broadcasters in the 10 o'clock hour between 10, 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. The, the restrictions on use of speech and other, and other restrictions that are, that are being applied here simply don't exist whatsoever. And there's, there's, there's no evidence. Indeed, the, the networks are very careful. Even during those hours where they have free reign to, to use whatever language they want, they still don't use that language. Not because of, of whatever the, you know, the First Amendment or not First Amendment, but simply as a matter of what is their audience want and how do you satisfy the, the greatest needs of the audience. And that is, but that is precisely what you would hope the First Amendment would do, which is to protect the editorial judgment of those who are exercising First Amendment rights. Uh, Thank if there you, no Counselor. You questions, have retained 
three minutes for rebuttal. We'll hear from co-counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Miguel Estrada. I am counsel for NBC Universal, and I'm speaking for the interveners today. Uh, my, I have two uh, points to emphasize at the outset. The, the uh, first one is that the lawfulness of the policy and not merely the actions of the commission with respect to the Fox shows is what's at issue here. Uh, and that's what this court saw in the panel opinion, uh, and that's what the D.C. Circuit in the first act opinion by then Judge Ginsburg saw. Um, both rejected the commission's efforts to confine the issue of the lawfulness uh, to merely the two broadcasts, because as is shown by the presence of the interveners and by the commission's own conduct, the entire th thrust of the commission's actions is to have a rule that they intend to apply to the broadcasting Actually, community. they said they were issuing it as guidance. Uh, correct. And so I am not nearly as confident as my, uh, as my brother, Mr. Phillips, um, that, that the court can simply dispose of the Scienter question, though of course it could, uh, without addressing the constitutional arguments in the context of the challenge by the interveners. Now the second point that I think is important to keep in mind is that the, that the commission went to the Supreme Court in the Pacifica case uh, with repeated assurances that it would have a restrained enforcement policy. And it is impossible to read what the Supreme Court wrote in the Pacifica case without coming to the conclusion that the restraint enforcement policy was an essential ingredient for the court's willingness to uphold by the barest of margins. But what if uh, the present Supreme Court doesn't agree with that? Uh, what if the present Supreme Court doesn't agree that it was a restrained policy and that was the basis of the five uh, vote uh, majority. I don't think um, I don't think that there is any basis for this court to conclude that even the present Supreme Court doesn't agree with that. If this were a question of counting votes, I will point out to you um, that the commission was very careful to insist on the court dealing only with the question in which the sole issue was the bare rationality of its conduct, whether there is a sentient being in the world who could think that this makes sense. And with some acknowledgement that it was a close case, they actually passed that. Uh, but uh, Justice Kennedy, who was a member of the court for dry ruling, pointedly pointedly declined to join part 3E of the opinion, which dealt with trying to reject the constitutional misgivings of the dissenters. Uh, and Justice Thomas, who was also, also a member of, of the court of the five, um, made it very clear, as clear as can be, that he would rule for the networks on grounds far broader um, than those that are being urged by the networks in front of this court. One of the interveners, I'm sorry I don't remember exactly which one, said that if we follow Justice Thomas's um, opinion we would take down Red Lion together with uh, Pacifica. Do you agree with that? I think we all agree that the question of whether or not the Supreme Court will continue to follow Red Lion is for the Supreme Court um, and that therefore uh, the Red Lion case does not really enter into is what it this Is it a red herring instead of a red lion? Uh, it, is, it is quite probably that in this case, uh, Your Honor, because the, the, the very most that the, that the commission gets out of that line of cases leading up to the Pacifica case is intermediate scrutiny. Um, and I think we can readily demonstrate that the commission's actions in these cases uh, really flunk intermediate and strict scrutiny. So what is the gist of the of your argument? On the on the intermediate scrutiny really No, uh, never mind intermediate scrutiny. What is the gist of the argument that the commission policy violates the constitution? Well, at the get-go is a content-based 
uh, a restriction, which is nearly always impermissible. On the second point, it is based entirely on a system of complaints where the commission has turned over the prosecution function essentially to a roving band of censors who are able through the commission to exercise what amounts to a heckler's veto. In the third, um, then you have no idea and no judicially manageable standards uh, as to how the commission comes to what the contemporary standards are that, uh, that are applied. And if you ask the commission today, the best that they can say, and this is what their order says, is that they know what the community standards are because they exist and meet people. I mean, we the commissioners go out and greet the folks. Um, that is not a judicially manageable standard that can still discipline and predictability. And finally, uh, uh, once you look at what the commission has done on the entirety of what the policy has been since 2004, uh, since the change, uh, the entirety of the policy boils down to a subjective assessment of the commissioner's view uh, of the artistic worth or of or merit of the works. So that's why Saving Private Ryan gets in and the blues get out. Right. But, but the entire system of an expert censor is alien to the First Amendment. And whereas you could say that the policy um, that, the com th that the commission urged in the Supreme Court in the Pacifica case was functionally different from the policy that the Supreme Court struck down in the Reno case because of the restrained enforcement policy, which uh, which did not go after non-literal uses and also gave heavy weight to the repetitive <coughs> nature. Now, by discarding the restrained enforcement policy, the Commission has essentially made its policy identical to the policy that the Supreme Court struck down in the Reno case um, and has made... It's the same language, isn't it? It is the same. identical language and, and in the final analysis, you also have to consider that this is a worse case than Reno because whereas in Reno the Supreme Court was willing to strike down the policy as so framed because of a fear that would invite arbitrary enforcement. Here we have a number of years of a demonstrated track record of inarguable arbitrary enforcement. You know, we have uh, a, a track record where you know the best a, a court can say out of the workload of the of the of the commission is that they seem to like Spielberg but don't much care for Scorsese, um, and that's not a judicially manageable standard that can be used with uh, with with uh, with an area that is so vital to the free society as its speech. Um, there's a whole second uh, raft of argument as to I, why. I, I'm just wondering whether um, it, it seemed to me um, as I entered the argument today on the constitutional issue that um, um, to me it seems that the soft underbelly of the um, commission's position uh, has less to do with the things that you're talking about than with the um, vagueness and confusing nature of what they have laid down with the consequent chill uh, which um, when the Commission is applying is prepared to apply forfeitures to a single utterance uh, and to very trivial and arguably non um, uh, indecent usages uh, would lead broadcasters to suppress wide varieties of things that uh, for which there is no earthly possible reason to to censor them that is absolutely such true. as uh, such as i mean sex has been uh, has been a primary preoccupation of people and hence of of literature and and uh, human thought for forever and uh, Shakespeare's plays are full of references to sex. Can a broadcaster play Hamlet with confidence that this commission 
will not find it uh, indecent? I don't know. No, no. And we have a record here that actually makes clear that a broadcaster can't even play those shows that the commission has previously ruled are not indecent um, because, you know, the evidence of the chill in this case, which involves even saving Private Ryan, uh, involves a number of cases in which broadcasts, which had previously been put on the television without incident, uh, are now turned down uh, by the affiliates because the enormous pressure of the astronomical fines is such and the, and the lack of predictability in the standards of the commission is such um, that it is impossible to determine what the standards are or what the consequences are. I mean, if the commission were to say, uh, you can't say, you can't broadcast the following list of words, and um, uh, except that you may be able to broadcast some of them in uh, dramas about, um, about patriotism during a war, but you can't do it in, uh, in, in programs about jazz musicians, um, uh, at least broadcasters would know what they can do and what they can't do. Yes, and that uh, would they, be a, There might a, be a different argument. There might be an argument that it was arbitrary, that there was no rational basis for it, uh, but at least they'd know what they can broadcast and what they can't broadcast. There's, and under the present, uh, I wonder whether they can have any idea what they're allowed to broadcast. No, and in fact, we have, we have said to this court, and we uh, had said to the Supreme Court, and we expect that we will say to the Supreme Court again, in due course, um, that, that the system is untenable for all of those reasons. There are others, I mean, and there's also the fact that we haven't even discussed today that the technology has advanced so far um, that the need for this sort of intrusive uh, conduct on the part of the government is really non-existent. Um, if uh, we were to leave this policy in place, would it be the end of any live broadcast of breaking news? Well, certainly you would have to accept that whether or not it is a literal end in all contexts, it will certainly deter a lot of coverage of live news and other events and and that it will be felt more harshly in those areas where uh, where you need that local station uh, one of the ironies of of this policy is that whereas in many other contexts the commission urges localism as a virtue that has to be furthered by the broadcasting community. Because I guess they don't use those words in small towns. Uh, well, there are some who think that, Judge Pooler, um, and we also have a whole track record in front of the commission, and some of that is in front of this court, I involving the, the small town uh, football team, this is one of my client's cases, um, who came to a, up from, you know, from a behind victory to beat Notre Dame, and in the thrill of victory said in front of a camera, I am so fucking proud of this team. Um, and th the commission did not think that, that you know, the small town exception applied to that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the letter came into course in the mail. Uh, and so, you, you know, the notion that you can leave this, this policy in force in any way, shape, or form and not be prepared to accept that you are sanctioning censorship and a chill of constitutionally covered speech. Uh, is unfounded. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. You've reserved some time for rebuttal. May it please the Court, Jacob Lewis for the Federal Communications Mr. Commission. Mr. Lewis, your clients were just described as a roving band of censors. <laughs> Welcome to the Second Circuit. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm happy to be here. Uh, <laughs> May I start with a uh, hypothetical that I posed to your colleague who was representing the FCC several years ago when this case was before us, and ask if the FCC's position is still the same. I hypothesized that this was being broadcast on a network over which the FCC had authority within the hours, say, of the regular news program, and the use of the F word and the S word actually did take place in court, as you know, previously, although not in the Supreme Court. And then I hypothesized that the person reporting this on this case uh, to display to the viewers and the listeners the backstory actually 
broadcast clips of Cher and Nicole Richie uh, taken from the Golden Globe Awards, and I was told, we were told, that that would not be a violation of the FCC policy, even though it was the very same language and the very same incident that gave rise to the to the FCC's order. Is that still the FCC's yes, position? That's still the FCC's position. And, and what is the basis for that? There are two distinctions between uh, doing a news show. W one is that it would be an, as the, the clips would be broadcast as part of a news show. Is there a news exception? There's not an exception, Your Honor, but the Commission made clear in the early show decision in this very order that the Commission bends over backwards where the news, pro news coverage We're going to rely on the Commission bending over backwards well, without I, a written exception? I think exception? broadcasters ha have been able to rely on the fact that with regard to news programming, and this is not just the order in this case, but as long ago as a case involving broadcast by NPR of tapes involving John Gotti, who repeated over and over again in several of these expletives, that the Commission does not does take into account in employing its contextual analysis the fact that we're talking about news programs. So, so also, what if what if Mr. Estrada's example, which I gather I'm not aware of it, but I I missed it. I guess I will say it's, it's <laughs> rare that because some the Commission's TV never issued an order with regard. To, I think Mr. Estrada was appointing. Uh, referring to a letter of inquiry, which the Commission ah, issues in lots okay. of cases. Okay. All right. So no order, no penalty was assessed. Well, we we are. We or, or, it's being contemplated. Okay. Well, let's say that that was on a, a sports broadcast, and the coach just came up and said that is a sport. You know, ABC News sports section of the ABC News. You know, today in a in a miracle, Notre Dame got beaten. Well. And the coach said, and then they broadcast it live. The commission's always relied on the journalistic, respo responsible journalistic practices. And so I'm not sure how realistic or hypothetical would be. In order to report the victory, one wouldn't necessarily have to report the expletive uttered by. What if it was So then, then there would be a chill on the news? I mean, the. the no, no, Your Honor, I'm just saying that, that in fact, that there, the, the broadcast broadcasters do apply their own standards. But it was as live. They, as I understand it, this was a live oh, broadcast. I'm sorry. That, I thought Your Honor's hypothetical was my, my hypothetical was it then got rebroadcast right. on and ABC News. It would not be News live. And it's, at some point, they would, the broadcasters would apply their own standards. And, and if they nonetheless decided that there was a crucial aspect of uh, the, the reporting that required the broadcast of the expletive, uh, then they would have an argument that, that the commission should not... Because it had emotive content in the words of Justice Ginsburg? I'm it sorry? had emotive, emotive content. Yes, there, 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 I, I don't think the commission disputes that there's some emotive content to any... Even offensive words have an emotive content. The question is whether they're offensive. I'm, if I could, Your Honor, the facts of this case are quite different. And I, I think that the, the, the general... The, the, the broadcasters... Um, uh, challenge, constitutional challenges largely foreclosed by precedent. To the extent that they're challenging the Commission's authority to uh, elaborate upon and enforce federal broadcast and decency regulations, Pacifica upheld that power and act, the action for children's television cases. But in the didn't, it, didn't it, um, wasn't it tightly cabined in the words of Justice Ginsburg? And wasn't the, what were the five votes achieved, um, including two people? two members of the court, two justices, who only voted with the majority on the basis of a narrow reading of um, the case in front of them, the shock value of George Carlin's? There's no question, Your Honor, that Pacifica itself involved a very narrow set of facts. And that's not true of Action for Children's Television, which had the whole FCC and decency policy in, uh, in, at issue. Every case but, but, involves a narrow set of facts. Well, particularly in, uh, and that's true. In this case, is no exception, I, I would like to add. But, but on but the point I, about I think you your point that is the policy, that, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Don't you agree that the policy is before us as well? The policy, of the, of the change in policy, were re relatively modest change from that eliminated an immun immunity for fleeting or isolated or non-repeated exploits. No, I, I don't think that's, that's the change that's, that's necessarily being talked about. The change in policy since Pacifica has been gigantic. Well, I, I, I'm not sure that that's the case, Your Honor, that the fact is the definition, and maybe it's time to talk about the vagueness question, but the definition that the Commission employs, a patently offensive and inconsistent with broadcast, standards for broadcast medium, description of sexual or excretory organs, that's all the same uh, definition that the Commission employed in Pacifica. Indeed, the, the 
uh, our first point is the vagueness challenge is foreclosed by precedent because as this court recognized in dial information services and, and as the DC Circuit recognized in the Action for Children's Television cases, the Supreme Court uh, application of the definition in Pacifica implicitly holds that that definition is not so vague that you can't apply it and that it's unconstitutional. But putting that to one side, things have only gotten better in terms of guidance from the Commission since Pacifica. The Commission issued a comprehensive set of guide, industry guidance in 2001, which goes through many of its prior decisions and, and sets forth it and elaborates upon its framework. And indeed, in, in a number of cases, including a number of cases in this very order, uh, Section 3C of the Omnibus Order uh, sets forth a number of cases where the Commission found that it was not indecent. The Commission has tried to provide guidance not only through uh, the, its industry guidance, but also through elaboration on specific case law decisions. Is this the decisions. case where you found that the person who said bullshitter on the early show was not liable to forfeiture because it was a news program? Well, I'll admit, Your Honor, that was the Commission bending over backwards to defer to CBS's plausible characterization of the show. After all, the other interviewees before and after that particular person were concedingly newsworthy people. But there can we make a policy based on um, your characterization of the FCC as bending over backwards? Well, Does the First the Amendment allow us to rely on you bending over backwards? Which, by the way, is a funny image. <laughs> Your Honor, the, the point maybe of that... Even, maybe even close to the line. No, I don't think so, Your Honor. But, but uh, the point is that, that where the uh, commission analysis uh, uh, gives, uh, essentially defers to broadcasters on these issues when we're talking about news programming in light of the, the particularly important First Amendment interests and uh, values that are concerned with coverage of news programming. I don't think the broadcasters have any reason to complain about that policy. And I don't think that policy is particularly vague. They, they get a break in cases where arguably, and it was argued in the early show, that that was not really a news segment. In it, they get a break in cases where it's uh, in but news. But what about now. the next time when they don't get a break because some, because the commission thinks talking about survivors is not real news? Well, be, uh, Your Honor, the, the, there's, then they'll have an argument that the commission uh, uh, didn't explain a change in its policy. But I don't know that that, the fact is, I don't know that that particular example makes the commission's policy any more vague. The commission, look, this is an area, even apart from the precedent, you would think that the, the broadcasters are, uh, you know, they're really being a little bit um, uh, 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 oblivious, I guess, to their own standards. Here, we had a case where Nicole Ritchie and Cher uh, got up to the podium and uttered the F word and the S word. The, uh, Fox wasn't paralyzed in, in what, uh, knowing whether that comported with its standards or not. They had a delay system, an unsuccessful delay system in place. They tried to bleep out the word. They, they missed it in both cases. And then in later time zones, they deleted the word all before any kind of commission action on the part, they understood that th that kind of utterance in that kind of program where there were a number of children, uh, a percentage of children in the audience, it was attractive to children, but you know, was totally your, inconsistent. Your position would be substantially different, it seems to me, if, um, if you were coming to us saying, we have made very clear you can't use the F word and you can't use the S word. Uh, and there are a few other words you can't use as well. But that's not what you've done. What the Commission has done is said that in addition to some words which it's pretty clear you can't use unless it's in a very patriotic context, um, you, um, uh, there's this vast miasma of unspecified things which uh, if they pertain in some way to sex or to, uh, or to excretory functions, um, uh, not telling us how they're getting there, the Commission, if it finds them to be patently indecent, can bring up to $65 million in forfeitures uh, upon your head. Well, and, I think part, uh, part of and uh, I wonder how you answer why doesn't that, why doesn't the vagueness of that, uh, the capacity resulting from the vagueness and the catastrophic possibilities resulting from uh, uh, imposition of forfeitures, uh, chilling, having the capacity to chill all sorts of references 
uh, uh, indirect, direct, or otherwise to sex or to excretory functions, why doesn't that make constitute impermissible censorship? I, I think what Your Honor is pointing to is the, is the very basis of the contextual analysis that was approved in Pacifica. This, this, the, as the Supreme Court Pacifica, you know, Pacifica was extremely narrow, and if you haven't read it enough to know how many times the judges said, we're only talking about this case, we're only talking about this extreme thing, uh, read it again, well, uh, because uh, stop me, telling us that Pacifica well, then, ruled on this. It didn't. So give us some arguments other than that one. Okay. In the, in the case last term, the Supreme Court said, the Commission's decision to look at the patent offensiveness of even isolated uses of sexual and extratory words fits with the context-based approach we sanctioned in Pacifica. That's at page 1812 of the Court's opinion last term. May, may I remind you what my question is? Well, Why uh, the, doesn't the capacity to chill resulting from the vagueness and all-encompassing potential uh, 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 finding of forfeiture because of some reference to sex or excretory functions, why doesn't that amount to unconstitutional censorship? Well, uh, three responses, Your Honor. First, in this case, there's no vagueness. No, there's no dispute that the broadcasters knew that the utterance of the F word, which after all was a centerpiece of... We're not just talking about, about I, I, these I two cases. We're talking about the broadness of the Commission's menace. And the Commission has tried to, to pr provide guidance over the years. With the has tried to narrow? Has, has tried to provide specific guidance about what would or wouldn't be indecent. What is the guidance as to, as to well, how, it, how it would be decent or not, or indecent? It, 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 it sets forth a framework. It talks about that they have to be sexual or exploratory de descriptions or depictions, uh, de excuse me, depictions or it's, descriptions. It said three standards, right? That's right. Three yeah, standards, three. and they were one, explicitness of the reference, two, amount of repetition, and three, uh, whether it was pandering. That's right. Okay? Then, in total disregard of that, it goes and imposes, imposes forfeiture, or not forfeitures, but findings of, uh, of violation where there is neither explicitness of reference, because calling somebody a bullshitter is hardly an explicit reference to excretory functions, it's using the word in a completely different context. There's no repetition and there's no pandering. So how does that guidance well, uh, help? Uh, to be fair, Your Honor, the Commission explained that, it, that in this case, which did not involve the, the early show, but was the F word, the, the utterance of the F word, that, the, that uh, under the circumstances of the case, it was pandering, titterating, and shocking. The, if you remember the One script, of them, the script, Ritchie. Sorry? Ritchie was. Yes. It found, but the others were not. Well, none, it, of the, none of the four or five others, Bano, uh, um, uh, The Early Show, Cher, Cher none of what? those others are repeated. They're not explicit. They're not explicitly referring to sexual or excretory functions. They're not pandering. They're, they're none of the things that the FCC uh, pointed to as Your guidance. Your Honor, nobody's, uh, the networks are not disputing that, that the decision in this case satisfied, that the Commission reasonably explained why, in this case, the, the broadcast was indecent within all three of those factors. The in word is graphic. Case, in which case? In, in the, the case you have before you, the, the, the Nicole Ritchie and Cher. The, the case word, before us is a wide open case in which we've been asked to rule on the Commission's standards. And I don't think but, the parties would agree with you that, they, that uh, the, each of these instances meet the test. Well, if they didn't agree, they could, could have run an APA argument saying the Commission didn't properly make the finding, but they've never done that. But let me get back to Your Honor's question. The Commission tried, uh, in, prior to 1987, it enforced the policy that essentially said, if you utter the seven words that were in the Carlin monologue, we'll go after you. Otherwise, we, we take a pass. And they found that enforcement policy simply didn't comply with their responsibilities, because what happened? Well, the creative community, which, by the way, includes radio as well as television, simply came up with highly offensive utterances that didn't use any of the seven words. So in 1987, in the... In the uh, Such as? Well, the, I, I can't repeat all of them. I can't remember all of them. But the point is, well, one doesn't one. have to use... Give me one. Yeah. What? Give me well, one. Two. Uh, it wasn't there, there, dick there or dickhead. Th no, these, these are words well, that were fine. Descriptions... Dick 
descriptions of sexual activities that were quite explicit but didn't use either the F word or the S word. The, the orders that were on re review in Action for Children Television 1 are quite explicit, they're highly offensive, and the Commission understood that, it, that simply limiting its policy, which might have been more clear, would, would had a tremendous cost with regard to the effectiveness of the enforcement of any concept and yet, of here we're back to the F word and the S word. Well, Your Honor, if the Commission didn't say, oh, by the way, now we'll reverse course and we'll flip things and you can use the F word or the S word. The, and that's one of our points. The F word and the S word, which were in the Carlin monologue, the, the broadcasters have always been on notice. Indeed, their own policies are to rate such shows MA, to delete the material, even when it is uh, broadcast within the safe harbor. By the way, the Commission's uh, indecency regulations have a safe harbor uh, for uh, programming after 10 p.m. and before 6 a.m. And the fact is that any broadcaster who's under some confusion in their own mind about whether a particular broadcast would be found indecent by the Commission or not is simply to just put the bro programming in the safe harbor. And that's what the D.C. Circuit found. Your, you tell us in your brief that the purpose of the Commission's policy is twofold. To protect the physical and psychological well-being of children and to, um, to enforce uh, the parents' authority over their household. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Now, my first question is, is what are you protecting children from? Well, the, the, the Protect their physical and psychological well-being from what? I, I think the idea is the same point that made in Pacifica that a broadcast with an indecent uh, description or indecent language, particularly indecent language, can enlarge a child's vocabulary in an instant. The court found that to be a harm to children in Pacifica. It's con the courts that have considered this issue since have, have found that. And indeed, the court, Supreme Court last term made specific the point that there, you don't have to prove a scientific uh, 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 have because scientific. it's common sense. Exactly, it's common sense. Do you believe, and that's small, do you believe they don't use these words in small towns? Uh, I, I don't have an, uh, I'm not sure I have any. Because that's also wanna... common sense, I guess, too. Well, Your Honor, the point here is that, that it suffices to know that children, this, and again, I'm quoting from the Supreme Court's opinion, mimic the behavior they observe, or at least the behavior that's presented to them as normal and appropriate. Programming replete with one word indecent expletives will tend to produce children who use at least one word indecent expletives. That's always been a sufficient basis for the uh, congressional action in uh, authorizing the commission to regulate broadcast indecency. And I think that was re reaffirmed by the court in just last term. So that the question of harm, I under, think is- Under it, as counsel pointed out, opposing counsel, under an APA analysis, well, but, not but under some a First the, Amendment analysis. That's correct, Your Honor, but some of these statements Which by the Which is more court, differential, you agree? That's, it was described as being a more differential analysis. Well, uh, Your Honor, some of these statements that the court made last term relate uh, equally to the First Amendment issue. Really? I thought they didn't touch the First Amendment. Well, I'll, I'll read from pages 18, 13 to 14. If, if this, this is where, on this harm question, the court says we have case. We have a case that talks about that the government interests of uh, in, in well-being of its youth. This is their quoting from Ginsburg, which was a First Amendment case, uh, justifies the regulations. They were saying in the Ginsburg case they didn't require a showing of harm, and then the court went on to say if the Constitution itself demands of agencies no more scientifically certain criteria to comply with the First Amendment. Neither does the APA. In that instance, the court was looking to the First Amendment law to answer the APA question. So I think it's a mistake to say that nothing in the opinion relates to these constitutions. It seems to me you, you've just contradicted yourself because, unless I misunderstand you, you told me that um, uh, when the commission tried to rely on listing words, um, then broadcasters went around it by referring to sex uh, without using those words. So uh, is it that you're trying to protect children from hearing about sex, or is it that you're trying to protect them from certain words? It's the, the regulation is of indecency. An indecent uh, broadcast can consist of the, the repeated utterance of words, as it was in the Carlin monologue, or it can be a broadcast 
that's indecent because it's an actual depiction or description of sexual or excretory activities so that involves no one. So back to my knowledge. hypothetical, how are you protecting the children from those words on when they come up on the 6 o'clock news and you're broadcasting the clip of Nicole? Well, I think there are countervailing I interests that are involved. But how uh, are the children that? figuring this out? But They're still hearing the one four-letter word or the two four-letter words that you're trying to protect them from. But, that, but the context is different, Your Honor. And the fact is, it's but, not the case that... But how do we know? But it's not different. They're seeing, in my hypothetical, the very film that gave rise to this case that is actually quite interesting from a civics perspective because it's been here, it's been to the FCC here, up to the Supreme Court, back here, and as Mr. Estrada suggested, perhaps it'll go back up to the well, Supreme Court Well, the simple Court answer again. is that the parent can say, I am not going to allow my child to watch something the on the news program because there may be either indecent or other kinds of news coverage that's inappropriate for that child to watch. But the, and this gets to the point, I know Your Honor referred to it, and the court referred to the safe haven aspect of it. This, the fact that broadcast uh, programming is regulated for indecency gives parents a tool, gives them a place to go where they can be sure uh, and taking account of the So why the doesn't the V-chip do this? Uh, why doesn't the V-chip permit, uh, permit parents to uh, uh, disable the receipt of television on any kind of a show that doesn't have the kind of content that they want to watch. If there's going to be a, uh, a, a live show, if there's a football game where there's the risk that the microphone may overhear a player saying something offensive, or if there's a news program where people are going to appear uh, uh, and you can't know in advance what they're going to say, they can just say, sorry kids, you can't watch that. You can only watch ones that have pre-approved pre content. Well, it's interesting, Your Honor, the V-chip uh, rating system, which is the Commission found was ineffective generally, doesn't apply to news or sports programming. That was an aspect. It's a voluntary rating system that was uh, came out it of negotiation. It can't apply. So you can't. Now, I didn't say it can't apply, but the but the way the statute was set up, this was a voluntary rating system with the industry. And yes, the, but it can apply, can't it? Well, the v -chip not without changing be, the the V chip. The, isn't it? Isn't it possible uh, to require of broadcasters that they that they identify shows on which there's going to be. Uh, uh, n no control because it's a live show n with uh, with participants. I'm uh, just you pointing out under the, say, under the current that would permit people to uh, to to uh, obscure those under the current the statutory structure. I don't know the commission has the authority to require the broadcasters to do anything beyond the no, way. No, but they could they could impose they could they could they could secure their compliance with it. But the, uh, uh, putting that that uh, exemption aside. In this case, was entertainment programming. The V-chip clearly, the rating system clearly, did encompass the programming. The programming was misrated. This and this is a intractable problem, right? Yes, now. but my question is not that. My question is, can't it be devised in such a manner that if parents don't want to run the risk, if they're never going to let their children out of doors for fear that they might hear somebody say a nasty, they might also not want to ever let them listen to television where they might hear a nasty, and isn't it perfectly possible to schedule the V-chip function in a fashion where broadcasters will label their show, they're going to be live participants on this show, and they're, we don't know what they're going to say, so they could be blocked. I, I, is that I don't not know that possible? That, uh, I think technologically the, anything is possible in that respect. The question is, does it give the parent sufficient information to know exactly what's going to be on the show? After all, well, the, they know it's live. If they the, know it's live, isn't that enough? You can't control share. Well, the, uh, let me point out something else, Your Honor. The broadcasters have an ability. They would not even be in this case if their audio delay system worked. They had an ins, uh, uh, unsuccessful audio delay system, which they themselves put in there. So the, there, there is a way of addressing the unexpected utterance on the live programming, and that's to put a, an effective de audio delay system in. But in fact, the, the record shows here that so Even you're saying that, that, a, that a huge network can afford any amount of personnel necessary to, uh, to put in effect. But what about a local broadcaster of the sort that uh, Justice Breyer speaks about? What about a small broadcaster that has a, is barely getting by on its budget and it sets up a, a camera and a microphone at a public hearing, at some, some local public hearing? Uh, how is it going to assure that somebody who stands up in front of the local planning zoning board or whatever doesn't say something that you'd find offensive? Well, perhaps the, the, in that circumstance, the local broadcaster would have 
an argument to the Commission that they had taken reasonable and diligent measures within their resources. What reasonable to, measures? They didn't take well, any measures. They just set up the camera and the and microphone. Well, one of them would be, about, for example, Your Honor, that, that it was a local public uh, zoning core, hearing. That, which, core First Amendment values to broadcast, say, a zoning hearing, as Judge Laval suggests, right? You agree? Core First Amendment sure, values Your Honor, are absolutely. at stake? But I, I don't know of many. Says, this zoning plan is fucking up my house. And uh, uh, what I'm saying is the commission hasn't addressed, but it, it did talk about the equities of the case, and it hasn't addressed the situation of where a small broadcaster has no other means and had no other means to uh, impose an audio delay. But this case really illustrates why but the But we're talking about the policy. You keep talking about this case. But the policy takes account of the equities. And that's what, in the equity, the commission had a discussion in its order about how the equities played out here. But Look, the problem it the, isn't the problem, or the problem, at least as I understand it, is that the equities themselves are vague, so that the, the broadcasters aren't sure where the line is. But, Your Honor, I don't think the equities are vague with regard to audio delay in networks at all. Networks have empl employed an audio delay mechanism for decades. And the fact is they had one here. It just was an ineffective one, one that they knew was ineffective because they, it didn't work in the 2002 Billboard Music Awards, and they used the very same one in 2003. Now they uh, is, uh, apparently spend more resources to uh, uh, employ a more effective audio delay. But by the way, the can I, if I'm a network, can I broadcast a program in which uh, there is a debate over, um, over whether uh, teenagers, whether, whether, whether uh, uh, young people should um, uh, remain uh, a, a, a virgin pure until marriage, in which one side will argue in favor of it, the other side will argue against, or let's say it's experts, and they're going to discuss this question in the most serious fashion as to what the benefits and possible downsides are of the two. Is that something I can broadcast? I suspect you can. Now, you suspect I well, can. Well, Your Honor, I'm the Commission's lawyer. That's not very reassuring. Well, you suspect you I can. Well, you could also point to there are a number of decisions that involve shows that, that talked about sexual matters in the context of sexual education, and the Commission found them not to yes, be Yes, but the point is, the best you could say in answer to my question was, you suspect it can, and, well, I, and, I, and I agree with you. That's the best that can be said, but because there's no <laughs> way of telling, is there? No, Your Honor, that's not true. And the fact is that you know, a lawyer, any broadcast lawyer worth, worth his salt, and there are several of them sitting at that table, could look at prior decisions of the Commission, and there are some involving situations analogous to Your Honor's question, to the Commission's framework for analysis, and come to, in most cases, look, not You know what a good lawyer will say? If in doubt, don't run it. And that's the but very that chill get, that we're talking about. But Your Honor, a, a good lawyer might say well, that, I'm going to ask them. I'm going to ask them whether they are, can be more confident than the Commission's lawyer was but, when I asked the Commission's lawyer the question. Well, would they say, sure, even though the Commissioner's the Commission's lawyer couldn't well, answer the question that, with confidence. Good, we would tell our client to go right ahead. We'll ask them. It's a good They're point, Your Honor, because up. in fact the, they point to a, a situation in which broad broadcast stations did not broadcast, or some affiliates did not broadcast Saving Private Ryan even after the Commission told Or the 9-11. Uh, program. They but the fact is that there's obviously, if, if, if broadcasters are not airing programs when the Commission's already said that it's not indecent. There's a little bit of gamesmanship going on here. The second point is, look, there's a wide swath of hypotheticals that one can imagine. And uh, on, when one talks about vagueness as a constitutional matter, there's always going to be cases at the margin that are going to be difficult. The question is, is that it, do broadcasters have a sufficient uh, uh, guidance with regard to what the mine run of cases are going to be. And I think that the case law here, that the DC Circuit and uh, your own court in dial information Cases service. at the margin. I mean, uh, w w what about Hamlet? Can they play Hamlet with uh, with impunity, where, w w w uh, where without without bleeping when uh, when Hamlet talks to his mother them, about, Honor, about I post haste with dexterity to extend incestuous sheets? Can you do? Can you say that, Your Honor? I, I will go you out suspect? on a limb. I am you not the commission. I am the commission's lawyer. Yeah, I'm well, not going to say. What suspect. do you suspect? They, I'm sure that the broadcasters can broadcast. You're that. sure, Counsel. I have two short questions. Are you prepared to agree that um, if this policy stays in effect, there will not be live broadcasts? Uh, uh, no, Your Honor, I'm not prepared to, because okay. of the... Uh, oh, oh, because you're going to bend over backwards? No, no, no because it, 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 there are obviously a number of contexts in which live programming can come about, but this, the second point is that 
the, all you're talking about with regard to an audio delay is a few seconds, which, and there are already, as the commission explained, even in getting the signal to the home, given the number of, uh, depending on whether you're a cable subscriber, you have a DVR or whatever, there's already a few seconds delay. The idea that somehow live programming, that, it, that it's, that's crucial for First Amendment purposes that Nicole Ritchie be able to get her utterance out to the audience uh, in six seconds rather than 10 seconds really seems to uh, uh, turn constitutional analysis to one side. Here's my second question. Are you prepared to give up your claim that this is profane based on your brief in which you say that it's duplicative of the um, definition of indecency? I think our point is the court doesn't have to reach it. Are but we I done with profanity as um, a claim against um, the petitioners here? I, I'm not prepared to give it up in that, in that respect, but I, thought I do you gave think it up that in your brief pretty I, much. I think what we explain is that there's no, if, if you uphold if the policy it duplicates on, indecency, then it's superfluous. Correct, Your Honor. And if so, we lose it, we're not arguing that there's anything so additional there's, to profanity. So no broadcaster is going to be charged with profanity as well as indecency? But, Your Honor, I can't, the, the commission found this, these broadcasts profane. But I think for pr the present purposes, the court doesn't need to reach that question in order to decide well, the Constitution. Well, the question is, does profanity still exist as one of the arrows in the FCC's so, quiver? Uh, yes, although it, it looks very much like the same, at least in these circumstances, like the same arrow it already has for indecency. And if it's the same arrow as indecency, then it's unnecessary. Your Honor, I'm not going to, for purposes of this appeal, I'm not going to dispute that. Okay. So I have another question. Um, would you agree that um, free speech and pre free press rights are at least as much and perhaps more so for the benefit of the public as for the speaker? You agree with that? Uh, informed I, I, public? I think both, are, both have right. an interest in those. Now, um, if technology exists that would permit families that are absolutely intent on not having their children ever hear a bunch of words that they don't want them to hear. If the technology exists to enable those families to make sure that their children won't ever hear those words by blocking programs that could conceivably contain them, why should those families, those families that want to um, uh, impose the highest level of restriction on broadcasting, impose on the entire rest of the country what it is permitted to hear uh, in a manner uh, defined by the Commission so vague that, um, uh, that broadcasters would have to worry about and would probably not broadcast all sorts of things which, if they came down to it, would not be eligible for, uh, for, for punishment or sanction or forfeiture. Uh, why should the, I, I don't why should the public should, be deprived of the opportunity to hear all these kinds of programs because uh, uh, during the daylight hours without having to wait up till the wee hours of the morning to do it, without having the standards of what they're allowed to see and hear on radio and television dictated by the most restrictive people who are going to write letters to the FCC. But that's the difference here. There is no such technology, Your Honor. That's the question about the V-chip. That's what the Commission found, that the ratings just simply, the, the, crucial to the V-chip's operation is an accurate rating system. There is no such accurate rating system there. Now, Your Honors, uh, ideal, the you utopia. mean something can sneak through? No, no, it's not a question of something can sneak through. Here, the program was rated TVPG. A, 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 a parent that wanted to exclude TBMA <laughs> programming, for example, from by use of the V-chip, this, this programming would have gone straight through that V-chip because it was rated TVPG. And until there's some system by which the, the, the ratings can be accurate, then that V-chip is not going to be effective. And that's the simple answer to that. I don't think we're disputing that if there were a technological utopia, like Your Honor is positing, then there would not be I a... Don't see, a I don't see why it's a utopia. Isn't it a perfectly simple thing for, a, for a, a broadcaster to identify by some letter or code a program in which people are going to be speaking freely without previously uh, controlled text? Well, there, you could add something to live program to, to say that it's identified as live program, but that wouldn't tell parents whether there are lots of live. No, programs. but if they don't want to run the risk, right. if they don't want to run the risk, they say, "I'm not going to let my children watch live programming." But that's and the I'm difficult block it out. dilemma here, because you, you would that's uh, that solution would 
require a parent to exclude all live programming, like the solution of excluding yeah, all access right. to television. Because those words could occur in any live program. That's but right. there's a lot but of you're saying programming. those parents who don't want to run the risk are going to deprive the rest of the country of the opportunity to hear stuff that's perfectly appropriate and has nothing wrong with it, except that the broadcasters are afraid that if they broadcast it, the FCC, the FCC by, by its, whatever it into its patent defensiveness, is going to come down on them. But, Your Honor, I think that that doesn't serve First Amendment values to force parents to just exclude all live programming this for, their, for their households, or the same way it doesn't serve First Amendment interests to exclude television altogether the, uh, because of the risk that their children that there'd be indecent programming on, the t on television. It doesn't narrow the field very much, but the point is here, the V-chip, while it is a good concept in practice, and the commission approved it in, in, in theory, it's a good concept in theory, in practice it is proved not to protect. And so it doesn't constitute an alternative, much less a less restrictive alternative, and I could just make the point that I think council conceded that the standard here is intermediate scrutiny. So it's not enough just simply to show that it's a that that has that the commission's alternative of time channeling is l uh, less restrictive. Uh, the commission can show it's an alternative that satisfies its own policies. The least restrictive alternative test does not apply to intermediate scrutiny. If it's intermediate scrutiny. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you, counsel. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. You've retained three minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honors. I'm not going to spend a. I don't think I'll take the entirety of the three minutes. I just have a couple of points I'd like to make. Judge Laval, you. I think quite correctly point to the chilling effect here. Uh, Judge Pooler's uh, hypothetical about the zoning board and the possibility of somebody using the, the expression fucking as part of the description of the impact of that. I mean, that is precisely the example that the New Hampshire public uh, broadcasting station dealt with when they were going to have a debate among political candidates where one of the candidates had previously used expletives and they declined to televise the debate out of fear that this was going to show up. They don't have the money to uh, bleep out or to, or to protect the, the audience from that particular language. And given the alternative, when you're talking about $325,000 for a mistake, there's no question what you're going to do. You're going to self-censor. And that is the essence of what the First Amendment prohibits. And frankly, there's nothing that the FCC said today that should give any comfort with respect to what that kind of self What about bending over backward? Doesn't that give you a lot of comfort? I got to tell you, that's not giving me that warm, fuzzy <laughs> feeling. Uh, and I'll, I'll answer the question that Mr. Lewis specifically posed, you know, or, the ju or Judge Laval did, which is, you know, would you advise your client under those circumstances to run a particular program? And my answer to you is, if you're a network and you, you don't happen to have an extra $65 million lying around, my advice to you is don't run that particular program rather than, rather than run the risk. And the reality is, and if you look at uh, A522 in the appendix and a number of the amicus briefs, the ACLU's brief in particular, you know, lists out a whole string of examples of instances of self-censorship. And, and the bottom line here is that we are precluding a, the audience from a lot of television that's not only at the margins, uh, as the FCC's lawyers suggest, but is at the core of what you think of as First Amendment protected activity. And the court ought to recognize that and, and deal with it accordingly. The, the second proposition that, that he offered that strikes me as, as almost mind-boggling is the notion that simply because the commission has issued more guidance that the, that the industry now has somewhat greater understanding of exactly how the commission's going to apply this policy. I mean, all we know is that at least for one point, at, at one period of time, and I don't know what the present commission's view is, you know, the, the use of the word dickhead, that's okay. The use of the word fuck, that's bad. The use of the word piss, okay. The use of the word fuck, that's bad. Now, those could all change next week. We don't know how that's going to operate. Poop is okay. Hoop is okay. I don't know why, but you know, some excrement's okay, some is not. I, and, and the rationale for this is utterly unknowable, and under those circumstances, as Judge Lavelle said, this is light years away from what the court was talking about in Pacifica, and there's simply no basis on the First Amendment Would to Would you allow comment on what your adversary said about uh, the V-chip? I was gonna, was gonna finish on the V-chip. Uh, my, my, the, the position there ought to be is, is this a reasonable alternative that is less restrictive? Doesn't necessarily have to be the least restrictive, but is it less restrictive than simply sitting here and punishing uh, the industry under these well, circumstances? Well, he was saying it just doesn't work. What about that? Well, that's not true. Of course it works. I, I mean, he keeps <laughs> focusing on this particular 
pair of broadcasts. One of them, the PG broadcast, actually would have put parents on notice of the possibility of, of the language coming out. And so therefore, but, but the reality is, of course, you, you can devise a better system of applying the V-chip. I mean, most of the reason why it doesn't work is just concern out of whether the parents are dedicated enough to do it. But I, I think you're absolutely right, Your Honor, that parents who are, are committed to the idea that their children will never hear those words are precisely the parents who will figure out how to use the V-chip in order to accomplish could that. You, Part of the commission. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could you have a system which alerted parents to live broadcasts? Uh, I don't know. That, I mean, we could. We could certainly, you know, list I'm, every live broadcast as a PG program. Technologically, there shouldn't be a, a, any inhibition. problem in doing that. Right. There wouldn't. There, there's no impediment to doing that. And if and obviously, again, it may not. I don't know whether it's the least restrictive, but it's certainly a less restrictive approach that will if not fully satisfied, certainly satisfies it in the same sense that, uh, that the court held was adequate as an alternative ground uh, in the Playboy case. The last point I wanted to make, Judge Pooler, you asked about live programming. I, I don't know that it's the end of live programming, but what I do know absolutely is it will be a significant limitation on live, pro on live programming because, first of all, Smaller, now, smaller TV stations are going to have to get out of the business. They can't take that risk. And even for the networks, they're going to have to be extremely careful what they do. Um, and the reality is Fox tried to bleep out these words. It did so because of its editorial judgment of the best way to, to promote its audience's interest. That's the, and and you know, the FCC sort of rides that to say, well, it, you know, what's the big deal? The big deal is the First Amendment protects our right to make those editorial judgments. The First Amendment prohibits the FCC from making those kinds of editorial judgments. I ask you to set aside the FCC's order. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Estrada. Thank you, John. I would like to start with the V-chip point, which is also more broadly applicable to the entirety of the issues in front of the court. Uh, the FCC counsel said that the commission found this and the commission found that. And that would have been uh, of some consequence uh, when the issue in front of the court was the APA. Under controlling Supreme Court uh, precedent, both versus consumer union, all of the issues on constitutional law <coughs> are subject to independent review by this court. And that includes not only the legal theories, but also the adequacy of the factual support. And so that insofar as this court must examine what is really the assertions of the commission's lawyer in this case on whether this works adequately enough or doesn't work at all, uh, it is for this court to make an independent examination of the record in that respect. I think I'm correct in saying that with respect to the V-chip, the commission gave as one of the reasons for not relying on it that um, uh, parents uh, have found it difficult to use or don't simply don't use it. That is right. And so the, is, it, is it appropriate for uh, uh, parents who could protect their children by using the V-chip uh, to simply not learn how to use it and thereby uh, impose on the rest of the country uh, not to hear the programming that the rest of the country would like to hear? Absolutely not. And what the Supreme Court has said in like circumstances again and again is that when that is the nature of the government's problem, the government's remedy lies in an informational campaign and in trying to teach people how to. And the court said that in the Playboy case, it said it in the Ashcroft case, uh, it also said it in the Denver area case. So it, it is an invalid legal reason for saying that the that the V-chip is not adequate. On the second point, our first brief on NBC did uh, submit a number of the independent studies and the evidence that are far more recent than that cited by the Commission, uh, including those from 2007 that deal with the penetration of the of the V-chip. And of course, since last year, with the switch to digital, everyone who's watching broadcast TV in this country must have either a TV that has a V-chip or a converter that also has a V-chip. So V-chips now are 100 percent penetration in this country? Anybody who's watching the television on, on any area of the country as of June 9th, 2000, as of June 2009, should have an ability to use a V-chip. Um, that is what federal law was. Um, and there may be some narrow exception in some areas, but I think 
as far as the bulk of the country is concerned uh, with the switch over to digital, uh, there is either a V-chip uh, equipped television in the home or a converter top that has a V-chip. Um, if I could just say, uh, as I leave, that one of the You're most... Saying that, are you saying that, that television sets, older television sets, simply won't function anymore? Correct. Right. You need, you have, you have, by federal law, you have switched over from analog television to digital television. All of the old television sets, unless you get a box stop to convert the signal, um, won't, uh, won't function. And on the federal law, you may be entitled to a subsidy for the conversion, but if you take the subsidy, the box that you get will have a B chip. Um, and uh, now my second point is that one of the most striking aspects of the government's argument is, uh, is the repeated assertion that the commission will consider the equities of the case. Bend the, over backwards. Well, the bend over backwards and the equities of the case. The equities of the case um, makes us think of what equity is. Equity is the chancellor's foot, which is the best the, the description I have heard of what the commissioner, uh, how the commission actually does this, but is a, an inadmissible test for the First Amendment. And my final point is this. Um, Mr. Lewis also said that ACT in the D.C. Circuit and other cases certainly stand for the proposition that the concept of indecency at some level is, no, is not so, so devoid of meaning um, that it could not be applied in some context. And I want to point out that what we have said in this case is that the change in policy is unconstitutional. Whether the policy can be applied in the future on facts that are comparable to the Carlin monologue, the Supreme Court will rule in due course. But what has happened here is that the commission went from that sort of policy for the verbal shock and assault um, to a policy that is unconstitutional. And all that the networks have asked in this case is for the court to say that as a matter of First Amendment law, the commission has to go to the policy that prevailed before Golden Globes. Well, it's very simple. The broadcasters, the petitioners here think um, Pacifica is the end of the FCC regulation, and the FCC thinks it's the beginning. Right, that's, and and that's what we have to decide. And and the argument is that, like so many planets so far away, which may no longer exist, but whose light still comes to the Earth, it may not even be there, and the Supreme Court will rule on that. Um, well, but the I, notion I think that you're it, imposing too much on us. Um, uh, we don't have to decide uh, that Pacifica is the end rather than the beginning. I mean, it seems to me that the, 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 the issue that's being placed by you before us is whether what there is now is illegal under the Constitution. Uh, we're not being asked to, and it wouldn't be proper for us to rule uh, on all possible regimens that the FCC might devise. Well, that's the true. The only one that's before us is the one that we have now. Well, that's and you true, make arguments I... to us that that one is unconstitutional. Uh, I don't uh, uh, see it as appropriate for myself or for us uh, to go and state what are the limits of the FCC's powers. Maybe they can devise, if, if we agree with you uh, and find that the present one is no good, maybe they can come up with another one that's fine. But uh, the present one is what's before us. That is, that is true up to a point. But Judge your argument Laval. is it has to comply with Pacifica as, as Pacifica was decided. Correct. And that in framing what, uh, the, what the Constitution requires the Commission to do, the, the government is required to comply not only with the terms of that case, but also with the entire corpus of First Amendment law. But you surely as it don't argue today. to us, you surely don't argue to us that in Pacifica, uh, the court, the court ruled that this is the limit and extent of the FCC's power. All the court said was, all we're ruling on is this. We're not ruling on anything else. Correct. Uh, your, your argument would be no better than the commission's if you, no, if you I, argued I, to I, us that, that, the, that, the, that the, in Pacifica the Supreme Court somehow implied that that's the limit of the FCC's power. No, and, and I think actually you made the, the argument that we have been making, which is to say the commission went to the Supreme Court on the express terms that all that was at issue was the Carlin monologue. And for them to say that it allows them 
to do remotely anything else uh, is wrong. And for anything else that they wish to do, they must find support in existing First Amendment law elsewhere, which, as we have pointed out in the briefs, is contrary to everything they're doing. Thank you, Your Thank Honor. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you all. This panel will reserve decision, and I'll ask the clerk to adjourn for it. You can get more information on this case or watch the 2006 Second Circuit Fox versus FCC argument at cspan.org and watch this program again this Saturday on C-SPAN's America and the Courts program at 7 p.m. Eastern. In a few moments, a State Department briefing on earthquake relief efforts.